I had an experience that's called a shared death experience. And it's similar to a near-death experience, although less common. And when it does happen, though, it most commonly happens to healthcare providers or emergency personnel who are at the scene when someone dies. And those people, even though they are not dying themselves, may experience a life-changing experience similar to a near-death experience. And so that happened to me in the fall of 2020. After that, I just knew, like I knew something was wrong and I knew that I needed to leave Western medicine and the way that we were healing was not the way that healing actually happened. Katie Deming was a leading oncologist who was at the top of her field until she had a profound metaphysical experience that changed her life and worldview. In this conversation, we explore how her life and approach to healing has changed after having what's called a shared death experience. Her new work puts consciousness and living an aligned, healthy lifestyle at the center of healing. Cancer or illness is absolutely a crisis, and in every crisis, there is opportunity. And this is our body's way of showing us we have to pay attention. There's something here that needs a deeper look. You're out of alignment. And when you see it that way, you can have such a different viewpoint on it. It's not like you're fighting something. You're like not at odds with your body or the cancer or whatever. It's like your body is speaking to you. So let's get quiet and listen. Viewing illness as an opportunity can be difficult, but in Katie's experience, taking responsibility creates far more agency than how things have traditionally been done in Western medicine. I had to learn this a little bit the hard way when I first started talking about emotions and illness and people getting really triggered. Like I have cancer and now you're telling me it's my fault. And I was like, no, I'm not telling you it's your fault, but it's you're responsible. Yeah, like now that you're seeing this, like it's not, I'm not saying that it's your fault. We're living in a traumatic world and all of us are experienced trauma. It's not surprising that if trauma is correlated with illness, that there's things there to be healed. But now that you know that it may be related to emotions or trauma, it's like now you can do something about it. Isn't that better than like just having the doctor say we have no idea? Like I, for years I would just say, I have no idea. It's like bad luck that you got cancer. Katie's new approach to healing integrates the whole person from working on detoxification to healing suppressed emotions and trauma. I believe that our bodies are designed to heal. All of the illnesses that we're seeing as chronic illnesses like diabetes, obesity, neurodegenerative disease, cancer, are all related to the lifestyle that we're living. And that healing actually requires a fundamental shift in our lifestyle. But what's interesting is I believe that consciousness is the foundation of all healing. My practice, I call it conscious oncology because the foundation of it is consciousness. Before we get into this conversation, I wanna ask you to join this amazing community of consciousness explorers. This whole idea of pursuing expanded consciousness and the boundaries of human potential while living a modern life is relatively new, which is why we interview revered masters, teachers, experts, and practitioners to help you on your own journey. To stay up to date on the latest conversations, simply click subscribe below and you'll be notified each time a new episode comes out. I am so grateful for all of your support and comments. I love reading them. Now let's dive into this conversation. Katie, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you, Scott. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, there's so many things that I'm interested in talking to you about, but I think really to kind of frame things up before we get into the evolution in your practice and how you see medicine and healing is what was your background? as an oncologist coming into all this? Sure. So my background is I'm a radiation oncologist by training. So I trained at Duke University in North Carolina and then practiced for 16 years as a radiation oncologist and also healthcare leader. So I was interested in, in addition to my practice, I was interested in 
how do we deliver better healthcare that's more patient centered? And so I spent a lot of time designing and um, leading end to end cancer services for a large healthcare organization uh, that serviced the Northwestern portion of the United States. And I'm also an inventor and had a an apparel line actually designed for women with sensitive skin. And so that was my background. I was really um, very heavily invested into Western medicine and believed in the system, to be honest, from the whole spectrum, from prevention and screening through treatment. And um, so I had done that until 2020, um, as my career had been really pretty traditional. Mm. And, and what was the inflection point that started to shift that? Sure. Well, in 2020, I had just finished interviewing for a very high position. Um, I was nominated for the medical director position for all of cancer care for one of the largest healthcare organizations in the U.S. and had spent like five months interviewing for that position. And it came down to me and another woman. And ultimately, it was uh awarded to the other woman. And I knew when that happened, I was like, I know this is happening for a reason. I actually didn't really want the job because I was kind of becoming disillusioned with Western medicine mm -hmm. at that time, but couldn't articulate it quite um, well enough to say what it was that was the problem. But I had this sense when that happened that I was like, oh, this is happening for a reason. And then literally it was within a couple of weeks, I had an experience that's called a shared death experience. And it's similar to a near-death experience, although less common. And when it does happen, though, it most commonly happens to healthcare providers or emergency personnel who are at the scene when someone dies. And those people, even though they are not dying themselves, may experience a life-changing experience similar to a near-death experience. And so that happened to me in the fall of 2020. And after that, I just knew, like I knew something was wrong and I knew that I needed to leave Western medicine and the way that we were healing was not the way that healing actually happened. Can you share a little bit about the specifics of the shared death experience? Sure. So, and mine is a little bit different because I wasn't at the scene. It wasn't like it happened at the scene. Oftentimes these experiences are ER doctors or ER nurses or emergency personnel and like at the scene where someone's physically dying. And mine was different um, in that the person was not physically with me. And the other interesting thing about it was that I didn't know the person, although I was entangled with her energetically. And so what happened was, is that one night in the fall of 2020, I was meditating and in my meditation, a woman's voice came in and she started talking to me and she said, I can't leave but it's not because of me, it's because of them. And instinctively, I just knew that she was dying. I've spent a lot of my career around death and dying and um, have cared for over 5,000 patients in my career. And about half of my practice was palliative. And I really actually enjoyed being with people who are facing the end of their life. And so when she started talking to me, I just instinctively knew that she was dying. And so I started talking to her as if I had been physically with her. And so I said to her, you know, there's no rush. You'll know when it's time and I'll stay with you. And so then I just sat with her in my meditation and I was probably in that meditation for about 35 to 40 minutes. But at some point I saw who it was that I was sitting with. Mm. And it was this woman who was connected to one of my colleagues. So one of my colleagues that I worked with had a young friend. So my friend was in her early, or my colleague was in her early thirties and her best friend from childhood, who was also in her early thirties was dying of breast cancer. And this woman's name was Misty. And so Misty was dying of breast cancer and I had been helping my colleague care for Misty. 
So Misty lived in Seattle. I live in Portland, Oregon. And my friend had been going back and forth to help take care of Misty. And so I would help her make sure that her wishes were honored, that she could stay home, that she was, you know, her pain was well controlled, that she was able to be at home when she passed. So really just coaching my friend on how do you maneuver through this? And, I, and when you're in your 30s, you don't know how to help someone through this, you know, end of life transition. And so I was helping my colleague with that and also coaching my colleague on how to grieve and how to deal with the loss of such a close friend at such a young age, because it's not something that we expect. And so anyway, I saw that this was Misty. And so I just still stayed with her. And then at some point in the meditation, I started to feel her body or soul pulling away from the body rather. And so it was like this pulling, like this upward sensation that I could feel that was pulling up. And then all of a sudden I heard these like pops, like pop, 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 like strings popping, like somehow there was something tethering her to her physical body with her soul. And as that was releasing, I heard these pops. And then as soon as the last pop happened, it was like the sky opened up and all of a sudden I was in something like the brightest light that I could describe and also felt just pure love. And at that moment, Misty gasped and she was like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. I never had to worry. And she, there was so much peace. Like I just felt so much peace from her. And then she was gone like that. She was just gone. And then I was just in this space. And all I could feel was just this love that is ineffable, like totally indescribable and the warmth and the love and the light. And I didn't know at all what was happening, except for that it was overwhelming and that I was just soaking it all in. And I don't know how long I was there for because time doesn't exist outside the veil. And so um, I don't know what how long I was actually there. But when I came back, I was confused because I was like, what just happened? I had no context for this. If you, you know, you have to understand that at the time I was like just a traditional like 3D doctor. Like I didn't have metaphysical experiences. I didn't even have a context for what that could have been. And so I thought I was like, did I just make that up? Like what just happened? And so I went up and I went to bed and I didn't tell my husband at the time because I was nervous. I was like, he's going to think I was like, you know, making things up or maybe I'm going crazy. And I was like, I'm not doing drugs. I didn't know what had happened. I went to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I woke up to a text from my colleague. And it was, I can't remember if she sent a picture that morning. It was just a text that basically said, thank you so much for helping me with Misty. Misty transitioned last night and I really appreciate all your support. And she had no idea that this had happened, right? And I didn't know how to even say to her, like, oh, I know. I know she died last night. I was with her. And so I just, I was like, I know, you know, this is a strange question, but can you tell me what time Misty passed last night? And the time that Misty passed was within minutes of the time that my meditation had finished. And I knew that that had happened for a reason to give me confirmation that what had happened was real, that I really did have this metaphysical experience and that I wouldn't just brush it off. But it took me time to integrate and to understand what had happened to me. But basically, you know, I had connected with her soul in some way to experience what is outside that veil. And um, that experience fundamentally changed me, much like people who have near-death experiences, they come back and they're different. And so that, that happened to me and I came back and I was different. And also I had very clear knowings about certain things that I didn't like know something. I can't say like where I gained the knowledge. It was just like I know like mm. something to be true. And one of the things that became very, very clear was that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing in Western medicine and specifically within radiation oncology, and I needed to leave. And so that was 
a huge decision for me to make, but that was one of the things that came out of that experience. Wow. What a, what an amazingly powerful story and experience. Um, just to, so it, it sounds like you had a knowing that you weren't in the right place, but there wasn't necessarily a directive about what you should be doing or, or what was wrong with the medical system? Because I've heard you talk about how that was also present for you. Yeah. So that was the hardest part was that I didn't get clear information about what the answer was. The only thing that I knew was what was not right. And that whatever we were doing in Western medicine was not true healing. And this is actually what created so much confusion and chaos in my life because I had in 2019, so in 2019, I had started to have this feeling like something wasn't right, and but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I had talked to my husband about it and said, there's something telling me that maybe I'm not supposed to be practicing radiation oncology. And he's like, that makes zero sense because you didn't have your first job until you were 32. Like I trained until I was 32. And now I had been practicing at this point, it was like 16 years. And I was good at my job. You know, I was successful. I was being nominated for these big positions. I was, you know, basically had everything from the outside that you would think you would want, right? I was at the height of my career. I had, I made lots of money. I was good with my patients. I had respect of my colleagues and I had a lifestyle that was awesome. You know, I worked four days a week. And so my husband was like, you know, I wonder if, it's you. Like, I wonder if you're just not going to be happy. Like no matter what you have, it's like, you're just restless mm. and you want more and more. And maybe that's the problem. And so, and I don't think like it sounds bad. And in the end, we did end up splitting because of all of this, but I know he didn't, it wasn't coming from like a, you know, bad place. I think he was really trying to help me at the time, but he was suggesting that maybe I was never going to be happy, that, that there wasn't necessarily something wrong with the job, that the, what was wrong was with me. And so I sat with that for a while and like, gosh, maybe it is me. Maybe I'm never going to be happy. But then when this um, shared death experience happened, it just showed me, no, this is not me. Like, actually, the problem is I've been fighting this and I know I knew something was off and it took this very dramatic experience for me to see the truth, which is I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And the problem was, is that there was not a clear path forward. It wasn't like it showed me like, oh, go do this fellowship and learn this. And then this is going to be the way to teach people how to heal. And so I knew to say, okay, all I know is what's not right. And so I want to take time and learn and study about what makes the body well, because everything that I had been taught in Western medicine was about pathophysiology, like what's wrong with the body and how do you give medications or in my case, radiation to fix what's wrong in the body, but not as not anything about what makes a body healthy and vital and how do you restore health in the body. So that's what I did was I just started studying what makes us well and can I pause real quick? You know, it's, it's just such an, such an important juncture that I think a lot of people listening fa face where they have this kind of mismatch between the intellect and an inner knowing where objectively your circumstances were amazing. You, it's, you went through the freaking many years of studying to become a doctor, right. And practicing and reach a certain level of your career. Um, and to walk away from that just is really, really hard for a lot of people to grasp, even when there's just kind of this inkling inside themselves that there's a misalignment. So was there something like, was there something that gave you like a trust or courage to, to like pull the ripcord? What helped you actually trust that inner, inner wisdom? Yeah. Well, I think that my, um, time spent with people who were dying really helped inform that decision because 
I've heard the same thing over and over and over again from people who are facing the end of their life, which is, I wish I had the courage to just be me and live my life Mm. and not do what everyone else told me to do. And so I knew that if I ignored this, that at the end of my life, I would be just like them. And I had seen so many of them that I wasn't willing to do that. And I had had an experience in 2019 where I had helped one of my patients use medical aid in dying, which is medical aid in dying is where someone who has a terminal illness can take a medication to end their life on their terms and not go through excessive suffering and pain. So I had helped one of my patients, and this is legal in some states. So I live in a state that this is legal in, in Oregon. And so in 2019, I had helped one of my patients with esophageal cancer die on her terms. And it was one of the most beautiful transitions I've ever experienced. And I remember after I left her house, I had this very clear knowing that when I left, I was going to be leaving alone, just like she left alone. Like, so it was her, my, her daughter and myself who were with her when she passed, but it was very clear to me that wherever she went, she was going by herself. And so when I left her house, I had this just knowing like when I leave here, I'm leaving by myself and I'm going to be accountable to myself. So I can't let other people peer pressure me into living my life in a way that is counter to myself because ultimately they're not coming with me. And I was thinking about my husband specifically at the time that I was like, he's not coming with me. Like when I leave, I can't point to him and say, gosh, I stayed in that, you know, job that made $500,000 a year because he wanted me to stay. It was like, no, I knew that that was just not going to fly. And not that there's like some, you know, fire and brimstone and that I was going to be like, you know, held accountable in some punishment way, but just that accountable to how I live my life? Was I true to who I came here to be? And so that experience in 2019, and then my experience of spending so much time around death, gave me this clear knowing that if I ignored this, this would be my biggest regret. And I would say, I'm a very courageous person, like, People oftentimes, it's funny, one of my best friends who's a G1 oncologist, she's like, it surprised me that you say that you're afraid because you're like the most fearless person I know, but I'm not fearless. I'm just not afraid to do things scared. And so that's just something that I've always done in my life. I was kind of an adrenaline junkie. I was a springboard diver in college and I loved pushing myself past my fear. So I'm I'm comfortable pushing past the fear, but for me, the biggest fear in this lifetime is to get to end my end of my life and look back and realize that I wasn't true to myself. That's my biggest fear. And so that informed my decision. And to be honest, it was hard because my husband and I ended up getting a divorce because he didn't understand. He like could not wrap his head around this. He's like, what are you talking about? You're just going to like leave and have no plan. And like, then what? And I was like, I don't know. All I know is that I can't continue to do that. And so it created total upheaval in my life. And I think that what you're describing for other people, this makes no sense in our, you know, the world that we live in. But one of the things that I always say is that your intuition is likely not going to make sense in the world that we've been conditioned to live in. And that's because what we've been conditioned into is not truly living. It's a structure of what the powers that be want us to live according to. And so if your intuition is telling you something and it doesn't make sense, like logical sense, that's probably correct. Like your intuition is likely not going to make sense in the 3D world because a lot of the things that we do in our current um, lifestyle is not really conducive to becoming the fullest version of ourselves. I completely agree. And I think, you know, intuition is largely misunderstood and not well-defined in Western society. 
you know, if you take the scientific perspective, it's essentially, oh, it's, it's pattern matching based on, you know, expo repeated exposure to many circumstances, like a, like a doctor being able to diagnose something after he's seen it a thousand times. But that's actually a very shallow form of intuition. And there's much greater depths of, of access to information um, that, it, that are, that are non-local, that, that are outside of the experience of space and time. And, um, you know, that's been a big part of my journey as well. And it, it's kind of like, once you have access to that type of information, um, you know, you, the, the, the lit, reason and logic, although they have a place, they're just, just one input and often quite limited. Yeah. Well, and I, what's interesting is since this event, <clears throat> reading David Hawkins work has really helped me understand mm. some of what happened. And in power versus force, he talks about near death experiences and what happens to people who have near death experiences is that they are bathed in these very high frequencies and it like tunes their antenna to higher level information. And that is really, I feel like what happened to me is that it's more like my antenna was tuned. And then I could mm -hmm. just, I could sense when something felt aligned or true for me or, or, or not, you know, and, and so just following that. But what's interesting is it's really flipped on its head the way that I use my logical mind. So I am a scientist. I am a medical doctor. I have all of this information. And I also know how to research. And it used to be that I would just fill my head with all of the information that was in front of me. And since this event, I do research and inquiry much differently now. Now I, I allow myself to be kind of drawn to something. And if something resonates with me, then I dive deep into it. And then I look at the literature and then I make sense. Does this fit with what I'm sensing inside me, which is the complete opposite of what we're taught. And I actually think that we're designed to operate much in the way that I've just naturally started doing it now, but we're conditioned in this idea that you're just supposed to learn everything that everyone else is putting in front of you. Which by the way, a lot of that information is, is, is a derivative of a limited understanding Correct. and misinformation. So you're kind of like, you're kind of like uh, building a foundation on a on building a house on a poor foundation, um, and even even if you like like my experience of intuition is that you know it's in in for me at least it's like I'm connecting to a part of my being that sees the past, present, and future all at once, and so it knows what's best for me in any instance. And if I tried to if you were just to limit yourself of the intellect of just like trying to read and consume every piece of information, like there's just an inherent limitation to that system. Like you will never be able to, you will never be able to have to, to total information. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of like, like a big thing that I'm trying to promote in the world is like, you know, we live in a society that is obsessed with expanding the intellect. Everyone is constantly listening to podcasts and filling themselves with books and all this stuff. And that's fine. There's lots of utility to that. But like, you know, if, if there was a more emphasis on working on the consciousness so that these channels could open up so that your, your vibration would reach a level where you start to resonate with information that that is available at, at a, at a higher vibration, like, man, like that, there's just so much more leverage that you get for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And we can't, I, someone told me a statistic a couple of weeks ago that they said in the 1700s, we consume more in a, information in a day that someone in the 1700s would consume in a whole year. And it's just, you know, and, and that's just even like a tiny drop in the bucket, but you're absolutely right is that we are um, inundated with information, but, and some of it in misinformation and, you know, misdirecting us. But um, that's why I read so much less now. Like I spend mm. so much more time just tuning 
to information that's available to us. But I think that, um, you know, our lifestyle has really um, handicapped people from accessing that information. And I can see it now. And I'm, you know, undoing that for myself. After that event happened, it tuned me. But then I realized like, oh, I actually have to do some things because the modern lifestyle will actually draw me back into that trapped reality of lower vibration if I don't consciously, you know, take care of my body in a way that keeps that open. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a really interesting experience to have to let go of old habits that just no longer resonate, you know, things like alcohol, things like stimulants, being around certain people, consuming certain types of information, like you just feel it in your field that it is not sitting well. And, you know, those all represent choices of kind of which direction you want to invest in. I hope you're enjoying this conversation so far. If you like what you hear, let me know by clicking like, subscribing to the channel, and responding with a comment around something that you found interesting in the conversation so far. In addition to these videos, I do a lot of writing on the exploration of consciousness and my own personal revelations in my newsletter called Consciousness, the Doorway to Human Evolution. To receive these updates and more, all you need to do is simply head to the link in the description below and you'll be added to the community of 20,000 plus consciousness explorers receiving weekly ideas and inspiration in their inbox. I look forward to hearing from you there. Now let's get back to the show. So you had, you kind of had this tuning experience. Um, you realized, okay, uh, healing isn't what it is, what we're told. Um, and then you went on this exploration and I'd be curious to know how your experience, what you believe now about healing the physical body and how you're putting that into practice with the people that you work with. Sure. Well, I believe that our bodies are designed to heal and actually that um, all of the illnesses that we're seeing as chronic illnesses like diabetes, obesity, neurodegenerative disease, cancer are all related to the lifestyle that we're living and that healing actually requires a fundamental shift in our lifestyle. But what's interesting is I, I believe that consciousness is the foundation of all healing. And so my practice, I call it conscious oncology because the foundation of it is consciousness, but I'm treating, teaching, you know, techniques that involve the, the six pillars that I teach are about water. So the water that you're drinking, but also the water that we are because we are bodies of water with 99.9% .9 of our molecules in our body being water. But water is one of them. Diet and supplements is another. Physical practices like connecting with the sun, circadian biology, you know, grounding, connecting with the earth, um, emotional healing, power of mind and spiritual healing. These are the pillars that I teach, but not, I don't believe that any one of those things is the cure to cancer. But if you teach people what their body is designed for in terms of the natural inputs that we are created to receive in terms of nourishment, and then also the toxins that we're exposed to and how to detoxify your body, if you can help bring people into balance with getting the right nourishment and detoxifying the things that don't belong in our body, the body will heal on its own. And that comes from connection with our higher self, but you have to align these other pieces to get that right. So my, my practice is hard to explain to people who aren't in the world that you're in. Like for you, it probably makes sense. And for your listeners, I'm like, let's freaking go. Yeah. Like, this is it. Like it has to be both sides of the coin. Yeah. But it's hard for people to understand. But what I explain to people is that it's really like my um, approach is treatment agnostic. So I, I realized that there's a reason that I was, uh, you know, it ended up being 20 years that I was in Western medicine. There's a reason that I was in that system for 20 years and am now outside. And I really understand the whole spectrum. And so I 
take care of people. Some of them do conventional therapy because if that's, they feel like that's the right choice for them, they're going to do that. And then I all the way to the other end where people are, you know, doing absolutely no conventional treatment. But my approach is really treatment agnostic because what I'm doing is I'm helping get their body in right alignment so that they can heal at the highest level, regardless of what they're doing with different treatments. And so, and, but you know, the truth is that I do believe this and I've seen it now in my practice that you got, can actually heal without conventional therapy. And, you know, Anita Murjani is a beautiful story. This is a woman, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, her book is called dying to be me. And she's a woman who ended up dying of lymphoma and she had a near death experience when she died and she came back. Basically, her whole body was full, filled with these uh, tumors in her lymphatics, and then her kidneys had failed. And what she saw when she left her body was that she's not that body, and that she had created the illness in her body with her fear, mm -hmm. and that she was divine. And she came back into her body, and she knew that if she came back in, she didn't need any treatment that basically her body would heal itself. And that's exactly what happened is she came back in and within two weeks, she walked out of that hospital with no tumors. And now she spends her life speaking to other people. And so that's a radical example of someone who connected with higher levels of consciousness and their higher self. Sorry, my puppy's having a nightmare. No worries. We love puppies on the show. Yeah. And um, so she saw that and she came back in and it healed her. And so what I tell people is that that can be reverse engineered. You don't have to have a near-death experience to connect with your higher self, that we can do this by understanding the way that our bodies work. And so that's my practice now. That's beautiful. And yeah, I think I think a, a uniform thing. I, I've read a lot about the mind body connection, and what resonates most with me with me is that it is both, right? It is working at the physicalist level, making sure you're detoxified, and it's also all of the kind of addressing all of the trauma and inner woundings and misalignments that can tend to express physically. And you know what's what. I think a really powerful concept that I'd love your perspective on is that the body is like a communication. And like, for me, this was a very big realization. I read this amazing book when I was really sick, um, which I think happened because of the freaking COVID vaccine, uh, called the anatomy of the spirit. Mm, and, really and, and it talked about how the body, when it is in disharmony or when you're out of alignment, it basically uses illness to get our attention almost as like a communication mechanism. That's like, Hey, something is off. And it, you know, if you miss the sign, it just gets bigger and bigger until it hits you over the head with some s serious type of disease. And, um, that was just such a powerful reframe for how to look at illness as a message <laughs> that was trying to be communicated to us versus some major inconvenience that was, that we, we had no agency over. Absolutely. Well, and I think that this flips that idea that somehow your body has failed you because this is something that I see a lot with cancer is people think they can't trust their body because their body has allowed cancer to grow. But when you take the approach that you just described, which I absolutely believe is true, that our body are, you know, basically our higher selves is communicating with us in whatever ways that it can. And if we're not paying attention and actually my shared death experience was kind of like my frying head, you know, frying pan hit over the head. Whereas like in 2019, I had that message, right. But I wasn't listening like you're misaligned, like you're not doing the work you're supposed to do it. But I couldn't, it was just like, you know, subtle. And then it was like, I just got hit over the head. And I think illness is the same thing. It's the way that we can get our own attention to realize like something is not aligned here. Something's out of alignment. Something needs your attention. You need to slow down. You need to look inside. And, and that is the opportunity with illness. So 
um, in Chinese, the word crisis is made by two symbols. The first is danger and the second is opportunity. And mm. cancer or illness is absolutely a crisis. And in every crisis, there is opportunity. And this is our body's way of showing us we have to pay attention. There's something here that needs a deeper look. You, you're out of alignment. And when you see it that way, you can have such a different viewpoint on it. It's not like you're fighting something. You're like not at odds with your body or the cancer or whatever. It's like your body is speaking to you. So let's get quiet and listen. And, you know, by clearing out your body with some of these physical practices and the way that you eat and, and all of that can help you get clearer so that you can hear the message and you can figure out, okay, what is this all about? And I do believe that illness and cancer is a way there's something that's being communicated to you and you're going to miss it if you just blow past it and go have your treatment and, and, you know, think that there's nothing more to it. I really believe that there is something for all of us in every crisis. I, I think that's such an empowering mindset and yeah, the, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Western model is that it does seem to be more oriented towards these kind of temporary band-aids that like blast something away for a while but because it's not working at the core, at the, uh, at the consciousness level, often, you know, that thing just returns in a new form. Um, and I, and maybe even David, I, I've been a big, big fan of David Hawkins as well. And maybe even talks about this. Um, but yeah, there, you know, it's like, okay, if you have some thing with your throat and you, you know, you kind of just use medicine, make it go away. It's like, all right, well then maybe something with your stomach is going to be messed up mm -hmm. next time. Like it just kind of keeps coming back. And the met this, this happens in my kind of a funny relation, a funny example of this, um, that I think is a fascinating, um, thing to explore just in the broader reality of what is reality is like, it's like, you see this in relationships too. You see this in everything, right? Where it's like, if you don't address the core wound or the core thing, it just is going to return. You know, you're just, you're just going to be in another relationship that looks like that or another job that looks like that or another manifestation with your body that looks like that. And it's why working at the con the, the fundamental consciousness level is so, it's just so high leverage. It's just as like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's where it's at in my opinion. Yeah. But I, one of the things that I think, um, keeps people from discovering that is that we've been conditioned to take pills or do something that's quick to fix, like to fix the problem. And so it illness seems like you said, like an inconvenience or something rather than this opening or invitation to doing something deeper. And, and I think that this is actually, I've had two clients do this to me. And so I know that there's something here is that when I explain to them, you know, that there's really something deeper here, both of them just started crying. They're like, it would just be so much easier if you just told me I needed to take this pill or whatever. And I think that that can be scary for people too. Like, oh, mm. you know, and, and this is actually really something with cancer. And I, I had to learn this a little bit the hard way when I first started talking about emotions and illness and people getting really triggered. Like I have cancer and now you're telling me it's my fault. And I was like, no, I'm not telling you it's your fault, but it's, you're responsible. Yeah. Like now that you're seeing mm. this, like it's not, I'm not saying that it's your fault. We're, we're living in a traumatic world and all of us are experienced trauma, you know, and so it's not surprising that if trauma is correlated with illness, that there's things there to be healed. But um, this idea that people get that they're like, oh, well, now you're saying it's my fault. And it's like, no, 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 that's not it. It's actually much more empowering than that. Like it may not be your fault that it happened, or maybe it's your fault that it happened, but you didn't do it intentionally. I don't believe anyone does this to themselves intentionally, but now that you know 
that it may be related to emotions or trauma. It's like, now you can do something about it. Isn't that better than like just having the doctor say, we have no idea. Like I, for years I would just say, I have no idea. It's like bad luck that you got cancer. And it's like, that's not, that's scary. In my perspective, I would rather know, okay, there are things that you can do to heal. Yeah, no, I, 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 I completely agree. That's such an empowering mindset. And, um, yeah, I just have to imagine you have you have to have a ton of grace in communicating these concepts with people that are that are new to many of them. Yeah. Well, that's what I always say. Like I I love actually being around people who are facing life-threatening illness because life is real. Like there's no BS, like all that stuff falls away. So I love being in that space, but it's hard and it's like, you know, you you have to have a lot of compassion and sometimes I need to help teach them how to have compassion for themselves, you know? And so it's, it's a real um, different kind of dance practicing in this way because you can push people over the edge and then they're like, you know, they don't want to hear it, but it's like, how can you help people look at their lives and see the things that may be making them sick without having them totally turned off and just like shut down from it. So it's been a, it's been a learning experience for me for sure. What are like, what are the particular, um, you know, there's the detox stuff and the physical interventions and lifestyle changes. Um, but what are like some of the, when a patient comes to you and you know, the, the inner exploration to healing, like what are some of the things that you recommend? Yeah. Well, it's different for everyone just because, you know, illness manifests in our body from different problems, right? And it's usually not just one thing, but from an emotional standpoint, um, teaching people a couple of things around emotions. One is how to process and experience emotions without suppressing or getting overly emotional where they're afraid to experience their emotions. Most of us are not taught how to be with our emotions and allow them to run through us. But emotions are just like a wave. They come up and we're emotional beings. So we're designed to experience emotions. But if you allow them They'll kind of come up like a wave and then they'll peak and then they'll neutralize. But most of us shove them down because we've either been conditioned like that, you know, feeling emotions is not manly or whatever it is for a boy or, you know, don't get overly emotional, um, that kind of thing. And, and so we're not taught to experience that. So that's one thing that I actually work a lot with my clients on is like, how do we learn to experience our emotions? And one of the techniques that I love is psych K. It's P-S-Y-C-H, like psychology, and then the letter K. And Bruce Lipton talks about this technique a lot, but it's a way of connecting the corpus callosum, which is the connection between the two hemispheres of the brain, and by doing specific positioning. So the name Psych K comes from psychological kinesis. And kinesis just means, you know, muscle um, positioning. And so basically by putting your body in a specific position that can activate the corpus callosum, when you bring both sides of the brain online, when you're experiencing emotions, you have much more control over that arc of the wave and you can actually let it ride and you can see that if you just stay with it, it'll come back down to neutral. And that is very powerful. That is the first thing that I teach someone who has a cancer diagnosis is how to be with your emotions. Cause you can imagine, you know, we have studies that show us that emotional trauma leads to illness like cancer and cardiovascular disease, but that cancer in and of itself is a traumatic experience. So now they're being traumatized by the fear that's coming up around their diagnosis. So one of the first things that I want to teach them is how to be with their emotions. And Psych K is one of the techniques that I use. Um, And then also releasing past emotional trauma. And Psych K is also one of the techniques that I use for that. And that is just basically, you know, releasing those emotional traumas that they've been carrying around that have been trapped in the subconscious. So Psych K is one option for that. Emotion code is another um, type or modality that you can do that. Um, I also send people for biofield tuning because biofield tuning 
is a way to get at those things that are trapped in our field. But maybe for someone who's less in touch with the emotions of it, biofield tuning can be a way to release that as well, kind of unblock those areas. So those, what is biofield tuning? Yeah, so this was created by Eileen McCusick, and she is uh, basically was using tuning forks in sound healing. And what she started to notice was that there is, you know, within the Taurus field, there was like a map that she would find certain, you know, emotions would be found in certain areas. And then the basically there were rings, like almost like rings in a tree in the biofield that she could date specific trauma to certain ages. And basically what they do, she now, te- you know, this is like there are thousands of biofield tuners now, but basically she mapped this whole um, biofield and these um, practitioners, what they do is they use um, tuning forks and they can feel where the energy is stuck. And then they'll ask the person, mm. oh, what happened at age three or whatever? And then they basically can pull the energy into the center. The center of the Taurus field is like the open space and it actually can release through there. And I've had a few clients who didn't want to do traditional, like either emotion code or psych K or some of the or EMDR, some of these other techniques, but um, the biofield tuning was something that was easy for them and very effective. So it's just another way to kind of lighten those things that have become trapped in our subconscious. Nice. I would say emotion code too is also very, um, I've done it and it's very light, you know, it's yeah. like, you're not, you're not feeling a ton, a ton of things in the actual experience, which is, which is really powerful. Yeah. So all of these techniques that I use, um, are like that. Like it is, and actually this is one of the things that when someone is sick, their body is already compromised and they're already doing so much work just to stay, you know, like the body is trying to heal itself. And so the techniques for emotional work need to be light because basically if you push someone over the edge, if you go into like deep therapy, you know, talk therapy or whatever that is re-traumatizing, their system just can't handle that. And so I love emotion code because it's just easy. You know, it's an easy technique to release from the subconscious. Mm. So, you know, you're out here being a pioneer, bringing these two different parts of, um, I guess, inputs to well-being between the physical perspective and, and lifestyle and then all of this kind of consciousness work. What do you think like is going to be the inflection point for our system to start to actually make this connection in a more meaningful way? Well, I think that the system works exactly as it was designed and the system does not want this shift to happen. And so I don't think that it will happen voluntarily. I think that what will happen is that we will have some kind of crumbling of the system. And then these other ways of healing are going to come up outside. I don't think that it'll be centralized. I think it'll be decentralized and that people will demand more holistic approaches. Um, but I, you know, am curious to see what happens. And I have such a deep understanding from running large cancer systems within the healthcare system that I, 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 I have no idea what's going to break the system, but I do see that happening. And I, I see that, you know, people are waking up and people are, um, you know, voting or I don't want to say voting, but like, you know, exercising their uh, desires with their money. Right. And I think that's what's going to happen is you're just going to have people moving away from that kind of model. Um, but I, I, I'll be curious to see how it happens. And I think it's going to be quite painful. Yeah. You, you and me both. I mean, it's, 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 it's wild. Like I do feel like, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a much deeper acceptance and an openness to the idea that what we're being told is, is not actually a true, you know, I think COVID really kind of opened that up for people. And, um, once you start to get on the awareness path, I mean, it just becomes more and more obvious. 
Yeah. You just start to see it everywhere and it, and it can be really freaking painful. Oh yeah. You know, as, as you can imagine literally committing 20 years of your life to something that you no longer fully believe in, like it's really tough to go through that. Yeah. Well, and for me, I mean, I know what it takes to walk away from the system. Like as a doctor who still had student loans, you know, and then my partner not supporting me, having to basically sell everything and start over, most of my colleagues don't have the stomach for that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like this, a, mm. it's a, it's a big deal. And so, and I think this is, you know, you brought up COVID and I think that's a perfect example of the crisis with the danger and then the opportunity. And, and it may be that it takes, you know, another bigger crisis for the opportunity of a new way of healing to emerge. But, you know, this is what we did. We did for, you know, millennium was heal this way. And it's only been the past couple hundred years where we've been indoctrinated into a system that is so different from true healing, you know, and I think that it's, um, that, that system will fall and, and, and these other pieces will reemerge, but they've always been there. Mm. Has there been any kind of ancient healing um, information that has been particularly insightful or, or resonated with you? Well, I mean, I think that what's interesting is the more I learn, the more I see that we've known these things forever. Like, you know, talk about healing hands, the laying on of hands. Well, you know, people think that's voodoo, but it actually, if you look at the work of Gerald Pollack in the fourth phase of water, that the water that we hold in our body when we're receiving the right inputs is structured as in the fourth phase of water exclusion zone water. And the way that you can increase that um, structuring of your water is through infrared and our hands are a source of infrared. There's heat coming off the hands. And so what, what's been most interesting for me is that now I can put the science, like I'm like, oh, there's science actually to explain these ways of healing that we've always done. And we would just poo poo like, oh, that's just, you know, whatever voodoo or, you know, not real, but actually what I think is interesting is seeing the science. So one of those things is like laying on of hands. Um, but then, you know, a lot of these things are just the way that we lived before was healing in and of itself, right? Mm. Laying on the earth, the earth is like nothing but free electrons, which basically neutralize free radicals and inflammation in the body. And so for me, it's like really simple when you start to see the beauty and the design of the way that we were designed, we're a technology, you know, human beings are a technology and that technology is designed to run with specific inputs. And the closer we get back to the life that we lived a long time ago, the, the, the closer we get to, you know, healing and health in the body. And I don't mean to say that we can't use technology. Like, of course we should use the technology that we have, but use it in a very intentional way so that we're making sure that our bodies are getting the things that it needs. And if you do that, it's just beautiful what happens with the body. It will balance itself. Yeah. And I, and I think you bring up such a good point that like, you know, our body is a technology basking in the frequencies of nature is a technology. In fact, it's a much more advanced technology than the iPhone. Um, but we have kind of lost sight of that and kind of become technology instead of being our servant, modern technology, instead of being our servants, you know, we're often serving it. And so I, um, yeah, I'm just excited that, you know, people like you who are credentialed, right? Who have done the whole thing. You've done the whole science thing, doctor thing, awards, running hospitals, all these things are kind of coming out and boldly saying this because it's certainly not um, the predominant narrative, but it is, it does seem to be an emerging one that's getting louder and louder. Yeah. More people are waking up for sure. And, and I love seeing people who are deep in the system starting to wake up because 
it's helpful to have people who really understand the mechanism of, and the underpinnings of the incentives of what makes the systems work, right? To have those people coming out and explaining, you know, I think is really powerful. So, and like yourself, you know, coming out of your background, it's like we can all use our deep understanding of the systems that we were trained into to help others understand the limitations of those systems and also create a bridge out, you know, and, and I, and I do believe we're in a time of an awakening and more and more people are waking up. And so I love the message that you share with people to help them, you know, kind of through that, like, you know, as they're waking up, how, how are you seeking information and in, in, in seeking guidance? One I, powerful idea that maybe we can close on is I've heard you talk about how, you know, there was a moment where you started to have this revelation and we're kind of like, what the heck? Like, why did I have to go be a doctor? Why did I spend all this time studying these things that isn't actually a full representation of a deeper truth? Um, and then the revelation that that was actually an intentional positioning. Um so would love to hear more about your perspective on that. Yeah. I mean, there were moments where I was like, shoot, why wasn't I just born into a family where they believed in like natural healing? And I, you know, just did that. But then I realized like there is true power in my credentials and in my traditional um, training and also experience, you know, functioning at a very high level within the system. And I think that it makes my voice now more powerful than if I had started in the natural space and just kind of come up in that, in that way. And then also, this is why I share my stories because I know there are other people out there waking up. And I think it's helpful to hear stories of people who had a lot to lose to step away. Mm -hmm. And so for me in sharing my story, I like being honest about like, you may not know what you're supposed to do, but just knowing what you're not supposed to be doing anymore is enough. And I think that following those little internal signals of like, something's not right here, whether it's in your relationship, whether it's in your work, your higher self is talking to you all the time and also with illness. And it's like, okay, that it's scary and it's not supposed to make sense necessarily. And I'm not saying like throw caution in the wind and do crazy things, but, you know, listening to that inner voice, I can promise you from spending so much time around people who are dying that at the end of your life, you will never regret listening to that inner voice and being true to yourself. That's deep wisdom there. And I think there's a, you know, there's one of the things I love, I know we talked briefly about David Hawkins and kind of his map of consciousness, but it really does help contextualize your experience in a way that may be hard to understand um, by having that kind of like, oh, well, this is what this experience looks like and feels like and at this level of awareness or consciousness. And I think it's such a beautiful revelation when you can start kind of look back at your, at the, all the things you went through and realize that it was very intentional that you had to go through that and for the purpose of serving, for the purpose of contribution. And I think you're just an amazing example of that with, you know, now you're able to kind of go out and share this information in a, in a way that people will listen to that they probably wouldn't if you were like a sound healer, you know, um, from the get go. So it's, it's so beautiful. And, um, yeah, I just, I just wish that for everybody listening, you know, that like the, the, the reverence for all that we go through for, for a higher purpose. I think it's, it's just so real and so beautiful. Thank you. Well, Katie, if people want to learn more about what you're up to and where they can, you know, follow your work and maybe even work with you, what's the best place for them to do that? Sure. So my website is katiedeming.com. That's K-A-T-I-E-D-E-M-I-N-G.com. And I also have a podcast called Born to Heal. And on mm. my podcast, I share 
my story of leaving Western medicine. And then also I invite guests on to teach me and also my listeners the things that I was not taught in medical school that I believe that we should have been taught. And so I bring on all of these different practitioners. So the different techniques that I talked about, I brought Bradley Nelson, the uh, inventor of emotion code on and Eileen McCusick talking about biofield tuning and psych K. So we talk about all of the things I just bring on the experts that I w- want to learn from myself. And um, you can come along and listen with me. Amazing. Well, we'll link all that out. So it's easy for people to find in the show notes and Katie, thanks again. It was just such a wonderful joy to spend this time with you. Thank you, Scott. It's my pleasure to be here.